fun too to see everybody. Um, so thank you all so much for uh, coming to Sustainable Claremont's Dialogue. Uh, we've got a, a great one tonight with a Claremont connection, a lot of really interesting um, uh, information in the energy space. So we're really excited about it. Um, I'm just going to say a few quick words, uh, and then I'm going to throw it to our um, a member of our board and a member of our dialogue committee, uh, Lilia Hawkins, uh, who's a professor here at uh, Harvey Mudd College. Um, so all I really wanted to say before we get started is that um, we're going to be at the Claremont Farmers Market this Sunday, December 3rd, from 8 to 1 p.m., 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., um, we're going to be doing a, a free tree giveaway for members of the Claremont community. So we'd love to see you all come out and tell your friends and family and, and come chat with us. And we could talk about all things sustainability and you could take a tree home with you. Um, we're also uh, in just the beginning of our year end um, giving campaign. So we're trying to raise the funds to do all the critical work that we uh, take on here at Sustainable Claremont. Um, so if you're willing, able um, to to donate a little bit or become a, a recurring member, we we sure would appreciate that. So my colleague Han is going to drop that information in the chat box. Um, and then lastly, uh, it's finally sweater weather. So we've got SC Sustainable Claremont hoodies, hats, T-shirts, totes, all sorts of things. And we'd love to see you uh, representing sustainability in the community. If you'd like to, to grab one of those for, you know, for a gift this season or, or for yourself, treat yourself. Um, again, there's a link that my colleague Han will post in the chat box for you. Um, and then uh, the last thing uh, I'd like to say is that um, our, our, um, our dialogues will go for 20 to 30 minutes of a presentation from our speaker. Um, if you have any questions during that time, uh, it's best to really hold them till the end. Um, if it's really pressing to, you know, and timely to where things are at in the um, this the discussion, drop them in the chat box. And then as Taryn's kind of speaking, if he sees some things come up, he could, um, you know, address them as they come up. Otherwise, myself and my colleagues will will grab those questions in the chat box and we'll ask them of, uh, of Taryn at the end of the the dialogue, so we don't interrupt the flow. Um, okay, Lilia, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to you if you want to go ahead and. Um, do a little introduction for us. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I am super excited for our presentation tonight. And I just wanted to share, um, instead of a normal introduction, a little bit, a short story of how we ended up uh, inviting Dr. Narayan for the dialogue this week, because, you know, the bio was sent around with the announcement. Maybe you all read it. I don't need to reread um, the bio verbatim, but I think it's a fun story. So, a while back at one of our Sustainable Claremont events, Stuart recommended a podcast series to me called Volts, and I am obsessed with podcasts. So I was listening through a number of episodes, and I came upon an episode about a really fascinating company called Antora Energy that had this amazing new super battery, was the title of the podcast. And I was so excited about the content of the material in the podcast, I started sending it to my faculty colleagues who teach courses on uh, thermal energy and um, chemical engineering and material science so that they could have their students listen to it for their classes. I was really thrilled and it felt like um, if any of you are students at MUD, uh, an ode to the Harvey MUD core, which is a strong STEM core curriculum. So I was just really pleased. And uh, in the middle of listening to this podcast, about two thirds of the way through the episode, it was time for the Harvey MUD College Climate and Environment Career Fair. We only had six companies. It was our first ever career fair on this topic and we're a small college. And one of the six companies was Antora Energy. I couldn't believe it when I walked in the room and uh, the shock on my face. It was just, you know, it was one of those coincidences. And then come to find out that the representative of the company was actually a Harvey Mudd graduate and not just any Harvey Mudd graduate, Harvey Mudd Chemistry, which is my department and predated me by only one year at Harvey Mudd Chemistry. And um, so Dr. Narayan is not only a, a member of the company, but the first employee <laughs> of the company. So um, immediately I knew that we had to host him and hear about this technology and about his efforts uh, in Sustainable Claremont. I thought it would be just so perfect. And it was um, too much of a coincidence not to take that opportunity. Um, so Dr. Narayan um, has a PhD in material science from Stanford, has been working for how many years, Turin? Five and a half. 
I don't have. Okay. And um, is going to share with us about the technology and the company and his path and whatever else he wants to tell us about uh, this amazing story. So with that, um, can we give a round of applause, a welcome and um, hand over the controls. Thank you, Stuart, to Tarun. Thank you, Lelia. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. This is an adventure frequently. Um, all right, can you see my screen? Okay, sweet. Um, so yeah, like Lelia mentioned, um, like um, Harvey Mudd alumnus and happy to you know talk to the community again. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the company I work for, Antora Energy, kind of how we came to be, what we do, and hopefully what the future looks like for us. So um, I've titled this talk, A Box of Rocks, which is kind of the, the name du jour that's being used for this class of technologies these days you'll kind of see why that's appropriate in you know, a couple of minutes here. And, and yeah, just learn a little bit about the work that we went up to. So um, the company started back at the end of 2017. And so the founders, I'll just throw out the names here. So if I refer to them, it's, it's obvious. So the founders, two of the founders are Justin Briggs, who was my lab mate at Stanford and the reason I'm at the company. And um, Andrew Ponick, who is, um, also a founder of a previous solar startup that he sold after he dropped out of Stanford in his freshman year, sold it to Sun Power, um, worked there for a couple of years, and he's like, okay, I'll come back and finish my degree. And as soon as he finished, he started this company. So serial entrepreneur, extremely brilliant guy. Um, and yeah, so they were thinking about um, putting together a company. And eventually, of course, they joined together with uh, David Bierman, who's the third founder, um, who, was, who had been working out at MIT. And, and so, yeah, they've been thinking about the best ways to use their talents to tackle decarbonization. So they wanted to look at the, the larger picture of energy usage worldwide and see what are some of the big chunks that they can take a bite out of. So um, the one that probably most people are familiar with is gonna be the electricity sector. And that is a huge chunk of overall emissions. And that's actually one that there's been probably the most work in reducing. And so uh, we've seen uh, over the course of many years, uh, many um, pretty promising decarbonization techs. So it can start all the way back in hydropower back in the very, very, very old days um, to nuclear power, to solar, to wind, the latter two of which have been booming recently. And they've been doing a great job decarbonizing our grid, but there is still a hole uh, when you wanna get from a pretty high level of decarbonization to all the way. And that needs to be filled in by some sort of technology that allows you to have um, energy whenever you want it. And oftentimes that's attributed to energy storage, which would be pretty good in that role, but there are other technologies that can get you there. So, so yeah, that, that kind of gave an idea of like, oh, you know, energy storage is probably good. And uh, electricity was actually the first thing that we went after um, before we thought about this next sector, which is industrial heat, which is one that's often forgotten by um, people even who think about energy a lot. And that's um, one of the reasons is that it's actually just really hard to decarbonize. And as a result, um, you know, it's kind of been a laggard in this field, but it is a huge um, bunch of carbon that is just being ready to be evaded. So um, industrial heat, that's basically um, all the materials and all the chemicals that we have come from these processes in some way or the other. Um, and so industrial heat, well, I mean, heat is, is just energy. So we know that we can get clean energy from things like solar panels and wind turbines. Um, and just like electricity, we need heat like and all the time. So we need some way to store that and regulate the output of these renewable energy sources to make sure we can get the heat energy that we need. So, uh, traditionally, when you think about industrial energy, um, the thing that's going to come to mind most frequently is going to be fossil fuels. So um, methane, um, quote, natural gas, which is kind of a ridiculous misnomer, um, is the traditional tech that you'd use for this. I mean, it's it's it happens to be very good at it. Uh, when you burn stuff, things get hot, and that's what they're really good at. And they're being able to do that at quite high efficiencies. So you have a boiler or let's say a vat of steel that you want to heat up. You just burn a bunch of gas and you get very, very hot. And it's, it's good at that. Um, and industry uses a lot of heat because we make a lot of stuff. So this is a huge problem to tackle, both from an economic perspective 
at over a trillion dollars per year. And also from a decarbonization perspective, we're talking about the scale of 10 gigatons a year, which is huge. Um, but now, um, as we've been installing more solar and wind across the world, we've really brought the cost of those technologies down. And they've gotten so low that if you just think about energy more generally, the cheapest way to get energy in the entire world or in most parts of the world is going to be through either solar or wind. And that's that's kind of a paradigm shifting event because previously the cheapest way has almost always been, or at least in the last 10, 15 years, been gas. Um, but now it's actually cheaper to get electrons than it is to get heat from burning gas, which is actually pretty cool. Um, but the one barrier that, of course, is going to come up anytime you think about renewables is the problem of intermittency. And, uh, you know, intermittency, that's something we're familiar with. So if you look here at the renewable output of, say, wind turbine, um, it is extremely variable over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, but if you think about industrial processes, they are not variable. Um, in fact, in many cases, they need a pretty firm output all the time. There might be slight variations here and there, but it's really a, quite a stable demand. And these are not reactors that you can just kind of turn on and turn off as desired. These, it's gonna be a pretty complicated process to get these up and running or shut them down. So you really need the power all the time. And so when you have things like, you know, a, a passing wind or, you know, a cloud, you know, these things are gonna be totally incompatible with just a, a constant uh, powered industry. So um, we wanted to figure out, like, there's this problem that can be solved by, you know, some sort of energy storage. We want to understand what are the parameters of this problem and then figure out a technology to, to suit that problem, which in some ways is a little bit different than a lot of uh, uh, startups that are from in the hardware space, because a lot of them come out of research that's been done in a lab. And they're like, oh, this research sounds promising. Let's try to um, commercialize this technology. Uh, the approach we took is kind of the opposite, where we said, like, hey, here's the problem. Um, these are some of the requirements that we have of a potential solution. Let's just rifle through all the research that's been done in the past and find something that might work for this and then try to implement that. So in a sense, we're not we're technology agnostic in that, like, obviously, we're developing a particular technology. But um, if requirements change, like we're not really tied to it. We just find that it's convenient for this purpose. So um, if we want to just go through what some of those requirements are, um, so the one that I've been harping on here is dispatchability. So that means like whenever people want power or heat, they can have it. Um, and that's something that's you know relatively easy with fossil fuels, but um, can be a little bit more challenging with alternative technologies. Um, it also needs to be immensely scalable because we're not trying to tackle you know 10 pounds of carbon or whatever. This is a gigawatt scale problem. So we need just a lot of stuff. And so whenever you need a lot of stuff, you definitely want stuff that is readily available. Um, so that's stuff that makes up a relatively large percentage of the Earth's crust and the stuff that's on top of the crust. Um, it needs to be something that you can put anywhere. So if you think about other uh, solutions, uh, I'll just talk about um, hydroelectricity for, uh, as kind of an illustrative case. Hydroelectric power is, you know, in some sense is great if you don't, if you don't include the flooding of ecosystems and stuff, which has already been done and baked in. Um, but dams can only dam water. You can't put them in the desert or in the forest because that doesn't really make any sense. Um, but in many cases, uh, industrial sites are not going to be located in a very, very convenient locations like that. So you need something that can be put in multiple geographies. Um, it also needs to take advantage of existing supply chains um, because Having stuff is good, but you need it to be readily accessible so that you can actually use it. And when these things are being shipped around the world at uh, high volumes, then you can take advantage and kind of just sneak in there and grab what you need. We also want to make sure that we don't suffer from critical mineral, mineral constraints. So we're seeing that like a lot of minerals can be tied to geopolitically like precarious situations. So think about uranium from Russia, rare earths, which are primarily concentrated in China and other places that, um, you know, if they're not looking at the U.S. the right way one day, then like, you know, prices are going to skyrocket. So that's not really stable for business. Um, we also need anything we make to be safe. 
because uh, safety is kind of paramount over all this. You can't just be killing people and animals just for fun. Um, and really, at the end of the day, when an industry player looks at a technology that they maybe want to replace, it's going to come down to the bottom line. So, you know, even if you satisfy all these other constraints, it simply must be cheaper than the alternative, um, and ideally cheaper without incentives, so that you can have a sustainable product and a sustainable business. So um, we looked at a bunch of ways that that could be satisfied. And it turns out thermal energy storage is a pretty attractive solution here. So, um, and in particular, when you consider thermal energy storage, carbon is a great medium to store that energy. Um, and, you know, carbon is all over the place and it's actually, it's very cheap. So if you think about the cost per unit energy stored, um, it's like an order of magnitude cheaper than the raw materials that go into a lithium ion battery. Forget all the manufacturing costs that get on, tacked on top of that. So um, this is a technology that um, even if it takes a couple of years to develop, will still land under the, the learning curves or the cost reduction potential of existing technologies, which is really important. Um, the energy storage process in carbon is really simple. So there's no phase transitions. It just sits as a solid and it gets hot and cold. And so that means that there's much a much lower potential for failure and things like that. Uh, it's immensely scalable. And so this you know, uh, picture in the background kind of illustrates some of that. So you have a, a is industry that exists at a huge scale already to produce things like electrodes for um, steel making arc furnaces and also uh, anodes in the aluminum smelting industry. So these things are exist at 30 megatons per year. And so if we even take like a small piece of that, we can be storing like terawatt hours of energy. So um, we're not really inventing a new class of materials here. Um, carbon also happens to be extremely energy dense and when you think about thermal energy storage, uh, a lot of the energy stored comes from the change in temperature between the highest temperature you can achieve and the lowest temperature. And so the lowest temperature, that's going to be roughly set by what kind of process you want to power, because there needs to be some sort of temperature delta to power that. The high end temperature is really just governed by the stability of your material. So a lot of materials are going to be boiling off or you know, subliming um, when you get hot. But carbon can get 2,000, 2,200, 2,300 degrees and still be pretty stable and just sit there. So that gives you a huge temperature swing and thus a ton of energy that you can store per unit volume or mass. And lastly, carbon is a very safe material. So there has been um, some reports uh, in kind of in the ether that, you know, graphite is dangerous because it burns. But um, I can assure you that it does not. And we've tried taking a blowtorch to these graphite blocks and even our more porous insulation materials that are also graphite. And they will get hot, obviously, when you take a blowtorch to them, but you cannot set them on fire. They will just be hot and sitting there. And if they're in the presence of oxygen, they will, of course, oxidize over time. But that's like, it's a very controlled and nonviolent process. So, so yeah, carbon is a great material. And actually, in this picture, there's a gigawatt hour worth of storage. And, you know, that's probably a little corner of this person's um, storage facility. So. It, there's a ton of potential in this materials class. Um, so yeah, we have this storage material and now we need to kind of put it to use. So just a little flow chart about how our technology works in the broadest strokes. So we can take electricity coming in from, I mean, really anything, but um, the way we structure our contracts is that we're going to get it from renewable sources. Um, and then you run it through some sort of resistive heater. And this is uh, akin to like a standard toaster. So when you pass electricity through your toaster coil, it starts glowing hot and then it heats up whatever your toast and stuff. Uh, it turns out this is just that on like a way bigger scale. So you have this resistive heater that's just uh, radiating onto your blocks and heating them up to 2000 plus degrees Celsius. Um, and now you have these huge blocks of carbon that store tons of energy so they can be sucking up all this excess electricity when it's available and you just put it in insulation. And this is really a technology as old as time uh, to store energy as heat. Uh, people do that, keep food uh, you know, hot for like from 2000 years ago or whatever. So um, this is really well known. 
And when you want that energy back, now you're being presented with very, very high intensity light, which is characteristic of something sitting at 2000 degrees Celsius. Like if you were to look at this block, you would probably be blinded because of the incredible intensity of light. Um, and when you have that intensity, you can just make it incident on some sort of heat exchanger. And then that heat exchanger can take that heat and deliver it to your industrial process, be it like a reactor or you know whatever. Um, and the interesting thing, because we can access such high temperatures in our blocks, we can power processes that are you know, getting to quite high temperatures. And on the other hand, you can take this high intensity light, which I mean, light is photons, and you can shine it onto a photovoltaic cell. Uh, so you can take those very, very high intensity thermal photons and then convert it into electricity using, you know, not exactly a solar cell, but something akin to that technology. So uh, we have a battery that can take electricity in and heat or electricity out as desired. Oops. Um, so before I want moved on, I want to just emphasize that this is really, in some ways, not nothing new. I mean, the exact system design, of course, is our intellectual property that like we exist for a reason, but. Um, we're making use of some technologies that ex existed for decades and centuries. So um, what I've shown here, this is actually how people make graphite. So as I'm talking to you today, there's probably like a million tons of graphite sitting at 2,500 2, degrees Celsius that is just turning slowly from carbon into graphite. Um, and so these things just sit out in air. They're just covered with a whole bunch of carbon-based insulation. And so you can see actually here, there's a little bit of uh, glowing that you can see. So that's like you know, some of the interior insulation. But yeah, these things just sit there, pass a ton of current through them, and they're quite stable at these high temperatures. And they sit there for weeks to get graphitized. Um, and we also make use of like relatively low risk um, photovoltaic technology, which we really understand both from the solar industry and the semiconductor industry, both of which make use of you know pretty similar technologies. So this is a picture of one of our modules. And then each one of these little rectangles is a cell that has been tiled together to make this uh, larger structure here. Um, so, um, you know, we started and tour really as a, a research program around thermophotovoltaics. We've since expanded, of course, but a lot of our early work was with uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab to make really high efficiency photovoltaic devices. So we've achieved 40%. Um, and you know we have demonstrated you know a pathway to higher efficiencies using slightly different cell architectures, um, and generally photovoltaic cells are super scalable and modular. So if you take that individual cell, or you take this entire module, or you take several of these modules tied tied together, um, their efficiency will be relatively similar across that entire range. So whether you want one kilowatt or one megawatt, your efficiency is going to be really similar. And this is to contrast to you know, similar other power producing technologies like turbines, which have kind of a poor size scaling relationship of the efficiency. So a lot of uh, turbines exist at like the many, many megawatt or gigawatt scale because turbines can be really efficient when they're huge. But when you want uh, relatively smaller amounts of energy, the efficiency can dip quite a bit. Um, we also are, are leveraging standard semiconductor and PV manufacturing tools. So um, you think about the deposition tools we use, the, the chemical tools we use to etch and um, um, I guess separate this epitaxial growth we have into cells, um, putting the cells together into modules. Like these are all like really standard technologies. The material itself is not exactly the same as before, but all these other kind of surrounding technologies are pretty old. And the last thing that helps us is like, um, yes, so this technology is like, if you look at an individual cell and a cell the same size for solar, the solar cell is going to be way cheaper. But the thing is, we're irradiating these cells with such a high intensity, they actually don't need many of them to generate a ton of electricity. So, you know, a typical solar panel you might put on your house, maybe like two or three square meters, and maybe generates 200 watts. Um, this thing is going to be generating 50 kilowatts per square meter. So it's just like a little powerhouse. So you have, you know, a relatively higher cost divided by a humongous power density, and you end up with, you know, not that much cost per unit power. Um, and lastly, we're making use of an industrial principle that people have really understood for a while, and that 
Uh, if you make a lot of little things, you're going to learn really fast and get better and get cheaper. So this principle of modularity is incredibly important. When you think of very, very large energy projects, like maybe a nuclear plant, like at least in this country, we don't even know how to build them anymore because each one is kind of a bespoke thing. And so it requires a ton of engineering time, a ton of permitting to figure the whole thing out. Um, so we've kind of gone with a separate approach where you can sit, like make your individual boxes in a factory. So you have all your specialists under one roof can build it. And then when you send it out to site to be installed, now you don't need people with that same level of expertise. So it becomes a much cheaper and a much cleaner operation to do in the field. So, you know, our, our installations would look kind of like this, uh, except on a bigger scale. So each of these white boxes here is actually our, our fundamental energy storage unit cell. Um, so these are factory make, well, you just put them on the back of a flatbed truck and take them to site. Um, and then you have a pretty um, modular and pre-designed unit that's just called our balance of plant. That's gonna be our pumping and all of our tanks for the oils that flow around uh, the site. And then we have like a pretty standard and modular electrical system that we use to convert the relatively high voltage that we get from our renewable power sources to lower voltage that we can use in our systems. So, um, you know, we have this technology that has a lot of these benefits. And I mean, I could have told you about vaporware, which could have had those benefits, but you know, these are things that we've actually built and put in the field. Um, so one of the, the smallest building block, which is shown here, this is the actual thing. This is sitting in Fresno, California and it's generating heat and power on demand. Um, and so this is, you know, very much real. It produces, you know, and it's been sitting at 1500 degrees C for like probably a thousand hours plus by now. And it's reliably producing heat and power. We've of course learned a lot and made a much better version of this, but, um, you know, fundamentally we've shown that this is like a very achievable project. Um, and, and yeah, much like we kind of hope in the future, the, the bones of this has been, we made it inside a contractor's warehouse out in Bakersfield and then drove the whole thing over to Fresno where we have, you know, room to put this. And yeah, it's just been running off that. So we have this tool that's been teaching us a ton, ton of things. So we spend a lot of time iterating on what we've learned, building test rigs to kind of test individual components so that we can more quickly iterate and learn. Um, and really that kind of sets us up for a commercial deployment of a version of this a box that's going to exist in the future. So um, I want to emphasize that there's actually like a really large um, decarbonization and economic potential for, for some of the, the stuff that we're doing here. So um, as with any technology, it's important to start with a, a more readily achievable market and work your way up from there and add on, you know, uh, more improvements to your tech and things like that. So we, our first market is what we call low temperature heat and that's below 300 degrees Celsius. So these are processes that can be readily accessed with uh, high pressure steam. And that's like uh, that. And if we wanna use heat exchangers, we can use things like hot oils, which will only decompose when you start getting to 400, 500 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's, that's kind of something we hope to target first. And that's a heat only application to be clear. Um, because the heat uh, portion of it is something that we've known for a long time. Um, so that's already a large fraction of a gigawatt, a gigaton per year. Um, and then as we grow uh, and we start developing our photovoltaic technology and really scale it up, uh, we can tack that onto our boxes and now be a provider of both heat and power, which is a, a really unique uh, way to, a really unique uh, advantage that we have. Because um, right now, the only things that can really give heat and power are going to be a combined cycle power plant where you burn some sort of gas and generate electricity, as well as some sort of steam with the waste heat. Um, but we hope to do that with clean power. Um, and this is uh, really attractive for a lot of industrial customers because they, a lot of them are just really sick of the utilities because they're slow moving and bad. Um, and if you can kind of get away from that and you can have your own little solar farm or your own little wind farm your battery that takes care of all your energy needs, um, that gives you like a really stable set of prices. So you don't have to worry about, you know, if you look at uh, gas prices over time, it's like completely all over the place. It's really sensitive to geopolitical problems, things like that. But for us, 
you basically sign a contract saying like, we'll sell you power for X dollars a megawatt hour. And that's just going to be the price for the, the lifetime of the project. So we kind of get rid of all the variability and make it really attractive for a lot of customers. Um, so yeah, you know, once we kind of tackle that, what we call low temperature uh, industrial power and heat, there's a much, there's now another umbrella that we can talk about, which is the uh, high temperature application. That'll be your steel manufacturing, aluminum manufacturing, glass, um, you know, minerals refining, things like that. So that's going to be a much higher temperature, which is of course going to be a more complex technology. Um, and that, and with that, we're already talking now multiple gigatons per year. And now when you move into the global um, industrial hidden power, now you take what's in the US and now multiply that tenfold. And then you have real potential to take a huge chunk out of our global CO2 emissions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really what we see for ourselves in the future. Like there's a ton of work to be done, but there's also a lot of decarbonizing to do and a lot of ways that we can do it. So I think uh, hopefully people at the company are pretty optimistic that we can get where we want to be. Um, and like, I think a lot of the stuff that's really gotten us there has been from the very, very early days. We got a lot of funding through the government, which has been hugely consequential for us. In particular, I want to single out the DOE and in particular the RPE, which is, um, if you're familiar with DARPA, it's, it's kind of similar except for energy. Um, and also the California Energy Commission, which has helped us build out a lot of our photovoltaic uh, technology. And as we've grown, we've uh, pulled in a lot of money through various investors, a um, couple of which, I think all of which I've shown here, can highlight breakthrough energy and lower carbon as some of the, the biggest names in this field, and especially the field of kind of impact investing and decarbonization. Um, and of course, none of this work is possible without like incredibly hard work from so many people on this team. So uh, when I joined the company, it was like me and three dudes and we were sitting in Andrew's um, study and we then moved to an accelerator out at UC, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, just literally above UC Berkeley. Um, and that, that place is called uh, Cyclotron Road. It's a program where basically uh, hardware companies that are just getting started can use unused space in national labs, which is there in abundance. And you have access to like some of the awesome tools that they have there. And because a lot of those tools are very expensive and hard for small companies to access. So it gives you a way to access really high quality tools for like no money. Um, and so we did a little stint in Berkeley for two years. We had probably the most amazing view you could ever possibly have just overlooking the bay from the top of the hill. Um, never going to have that view again. Um, but we are, uh, so now we moved down, we started a facility in Sunnyvale, California, which is like South Bay. Um, so that's where a lot of our corporate team is, as well as um, the, photo, the photovoltaic manufacturing facility. And we recently got a new facility in San Jose for the manufacturing of our overall product. Um, and so that's that's where I work, for example. And And yeah, hopefully room for a lot of growth in the future. And uh, with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you guys have and, you know, chat more about technology if you'd like. Yeah, so great. Th thanks for that. All that information is just amazing technology and an amazing presentation. Appreciate it. Um, if anyone has questions, I've got about a million questions, but I, I feel like there's um, a lot of great people on this um, talk right now. So feel free to just unmute yourself or if you want to raise your hand. Um, whoever wants to jump in first. Richard, I see your hand up. <laughs> Sorry, I can't control myself. <laughs> uh, so, so Taran, can you, um, I have a couple questions, but let me just go one at a time and, and mm -hmm. let other people uh, ask questions. Uh, but the first thing that came to my mind as you as you ran through the, the basics of, of your technique, uh, what is the heat capacity of carbon? That is, how much energy does it take to to raise uh, the temperature of a hunk of carbon, you know, um, by a degree, et cetera? It, it, I'm guess I'm guessing it must be much larger than I had imagined. Yeah, and that's actually a very interesting point. And I was itching to put that slide in here, and I had to resist myself. 
Um, but uh, so you're right, at room temperature, carbon has a really mediocre heat capacity. It's going to be about 700 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Um, and that's that's less than a lot of materials like, um, uh, what do you call it, molten salts and stuff like that. But carbon has a really interesting property that its heat capacity increases with temperature. So, and like dramatically. So, you know, by the time you're at a thousand degrees Celsius, the heat capacity is now 2000 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And now that that's above like any material typically used in energy storage processes. So, and really from a thousand to whatever, uh, you're gonna maintain, you're gonna be at 2000 or 2100, 2200. So it's, it's quite energy dense. Do, do you understand why that is? I mean, what's what's happening physically to this structure? Oh, that is a great <laughs> question. I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of obvious like new phonon modes you're going to be activating at those temperatures or whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, well, I mean, if it works, uh, <laughs> You know, let's yeah. go with it. But but I'm I'm just really curious. I wouldn't have guessed that. I mean, sure, the, there can be a temperature dependence of the heat capacity, but but of course, sometimes that involves a phase change. And and you're not seeing yeah. a phase change, right? No, not at all. And and yeah, I'd have to get back to you because I really don't know. Okay, all right, right. great, great, great. Let's let somebody else ask a question. I'll come back. <laughs> I have kind of a, a simple question, and you might have said this, I might have just missed it, but the, the carbon blocks that you showed in one of the first pictures, mm -hmm. uh, where do you get the carbon for that? Where is it coming from? And how do you produce those? And, and what is kind of the energy intensity of that process? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the carbon, so you can either have natural graphite or you can have uh, graphite made from pet coke, which is a waste product in droves from the oil and gas industry. Um, and so that pet coke is typically taken with like basically tar, um, which is another waste product. And you pack those together and you just heat it up and compress it. Um, and it's a large chunk of that energy that it takes to do that is going to be like literally just heating it up. Um, and I don't remember the exact figure of like the, I guess, any energy per kilogram to make it, but uh, I guess you can kind of think of it as the energy it takes to heat up our box from room temperature to operating temperature. So actually, that brings up a, an interesting point in that, you know, one of our future directions is to take what we, they call like a green graphite, which is a uh, green carbon, which is just like the very low temperature process material. And we just put it in our system and then run as normal and it just becomes graphite over time. Um, so there are pathways that we have to reduce that even further. Unfortunately, I don't have like an exact number for you. That's helpful. Thank you. If, if no one else is jumping in, <laughs> I, I, I have a feeling that there's something special about your photovoltaics. Um, and you didn't mention what material it was made of, and I, I'm guessing that that may be um, proprietary. But can you tell us a little bit? We got a fifty percent, you know, efficiency. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to discuss that in more detail. So we use indium gallium arsenide, that alloy system, and in particular, there's a, a an alloy which is, oh boy, it's been so long since I thought about that, but it's an it's whatever the alloy is that's lattice matched with indium phosphide. Um, so it has an, a band gap of 0.74 EV. Um, and so the, the reason that we can access higher efficiencies is that um, our, our sun is really close to us. So we can get credit for energy that we give back. Um, so like in a normal photovoltaic, a normal solar photovoltaic cell, your efficiency is going to be the, the power you produce divided by the incident power. But for us, it's going to be the power we produce divided by the energy we absorb. Um, and so when we have, so obviously when we have like a relatively cold body compared to the sun, there's gonna be a lot of infrared radiation. So we of course lower the band gap of our material, but we also in introduce like a really, really high reflectance mirror on um, to reject light below the band gap. So we're at like 95 plus percent reflectance there. 
So we can return a lot of those photons. So, you know, the, the main efficiency we have is that 5% remaining of the infrared light um, that, you know, gets lost in our counting. But, you know, obviously because our block is so near our, our material, then we can just return that power and hopefully get a better photon later. Interesting. <laughs> Very nice. Lilia. I have a question. I wanted to ask what um, surprised you most about your um, your work in this company over the five or so years that you've been working here. What was like, maybe not if you can think of the most, one, one big surprise, because I imagine this is kind of, you know, it's exciting. There's discoveries. Things don't go the way that you planned. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can think of a, a lot on, on different levels. So, I mean, one thing that's really surprising or I guess startling for me is um well I came from like a totally academic background like I did my grad school I did a postdoc and then I came in here um and in the early days it was a lot like a research lab because we didn't really understand the technology so it was a lot of thinking about like how do solar cells work that was like the meme that we had in the early days um and so it was really like you know what about this architecture what about that architecture and then now it's like we kind of locked in a design and like the shift in thinking and going from like figuring stuff out to building stuff is is quite drastic. And I guess for me, it's taking quite a bit of time to adjust to, to what that is because uh, in grad school, you just think of like, oh, that's like cool. I'm gonna pursue that for a little bit. But here it's like, that's cool, but like, I can't do that because we really need to get this product out and let's do stuff that's really relevant to like understanding everything that exists about this product. So. That was that was really surprising to me. And I guess also surprising is in the, the earlier days when uh, we were focusing exclusively on the photovoltaic cell component of our tech and specifically the electricity, uh, the storage for electricity delivery. Um, we didn't really think about heat and heat was actually just a waste product for us because our cell efficiency is, you know, whatever, 40, 30%. Um, and just the evolution of our understanding of heat until that actually became the primary product of the company. Um, and just understanding like the vast market that that opened up for us that I really had never considered before. That was, uh, that was really surprising. Um, and I guess how fast a company can grow um, when you kind of have the funding in place. Uh, Cause you know, when I, when we were four people, like, when we added the next person, it was like, wow, our company is huge now. Um, <laughs> and then when we go from that, and then, you know, now we're sitting at like 70 people, but then last year we were at like 25 people or 30 people, like just the scale and the just so many things that you can accomplish when you have people who are just good at many, many different things that are joining the team. Uh, that's been like really mind blowing and awesome for me. Um, what was your actual question? I just kind of rambling. Oh, what was surprising to you? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Some surprises that you had, like, in your journey. Yeah, I guess, like, I mean, I guess it's also kind of surprising how people change and grow. Uh, so, like, the people I work with at the beginning, like, at you know, at the beginning, we were just, like, kind of fumbling around. But now, just people who are viewed as, like, the absolute experts in the field. And it's so cool that people go through, see people go through that journey and learn. Thanks. Hey, Taryn, I got a question for you. Um, you talked about the the shift from like doing the research to doing the building. What's the shift from like the building to the deploying it like out on site at these locations? You mentioned that you have one in Fresno, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Like who's like knocking at the door to get one of these next to their, you know, industrial site or like, who is like the end customer who you see as like the, the first early adopters in this technology? Yeah, so that's a great question. And a lot of our early customers are gonna be in the Midwest um, for a couple of reasons. So one, there's a lot of like chemical plants there, especially uh, biofuel refineries. Um, two, there is an incredible amount of wind there. And so much that uh, if you look at the the, the I guess the wholesale electricity prices over time, they're negative for like 25% of the day um, because there's so many tax credits for wind that it's it's actually fine if the wind companies 
sell it for negative money to the utility, but then also get the government grant that gives them some money to back that up. But that means that there's just a flood of power that's extremely cheap for the consumer. So the combination of the, well, first agriculture is there, and then the refineries are next to the agriculture. And then you have vast amounts of space to put in renewables to get the power that you need. And there's a ton of those renewables. It's just rich with those resources. It means that a lot of those plants, so like ethanol refineries um, and other sorts of like biofuels and chemicals, um, it's like a, a major market for us, especially because, um, you know, on top of all those advantages, California offers huge low carbon fuel standard credits. Um, so there's a tremendous incentive for uh, these biofuel makers to use low carbon manufacturing techniques because they get like like exorbitant amounts of money from the California government and other governments with these sorts of incentives. How big is like the the actual footprint of this? Like, you say you deploy something like you, you had like a mock up of you know a potential the different modular um, units and like is it do these places have space for it or is that a problem? yeah it's not yes that's the key so a lot of these early um customers are gonna have like an incredible amount of space like if you look at the google earth there's literally nothing there um and oh boy i'm i'm forgetting the energy per acre but like you can probably have like a hundred megawatt project in under in like a few acres or something. I could keep going, but certainly pe other people have questions. Who else has any? <laughs> Richard, go for it. <laughs> Sorry, here, here we go again. Um, I, you know, one of the things you mentioned, which really struck me um, is you you mentioned that you these blocks of carbon can get very very hot well that's the point um yet they won't really burn that is you know if they're in you know atmosphere then the 20 percent or so is oxygen i i just i'm having trouble believing that the oxygen doesn't combine with the surface of the of the carbon you know to form something like co2 or whatever mm -hmm. um but in any case, it, it, I think what would really hurt you is if it, it changed the surface properties mm -hmm. so that, you know, the emissivity changed a lot or, yeah. or you know, or it became thermally, you know, insulating or something like that. Um, can, can, I mean, you, there's a surprise, I'll bet, for you. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. And, and yeah, so... Uh, while it doesn't burn, it does oxidize over time if you sit it in oxygen. So we use, we just put it in nitrogen. Um, so the, the box, it's a sealed box with a very, very, very slow nitrogen flow, um, just to have a slight positive pressure to prevent like seeping in of oxygen and other contaminants. Um, so that, that keeps longevity. And like you said, uh, oxygen and actually water are both like really pernicious for carbonaceous materials. So, um, you can actually see like, that we have had cases where we're at 1500, 2000C and like oxygen or water seeps in. And then you take the thing out of the box that has been going and you see all sorts of weird stuff. You see pitting, you see like weird dendritic growths. Um, but these things can often be avoided if you have a nitrogen environment because we've had a consultant who is saying that they can take graphite or, or other carbon materials up to like 2,900 degrees in nitrogen and still maintain like pretty, uh, pretty high integrity of this thing. So, I mean, it should be noted that uh, once you get above a certain temperature, it's like 2,300, the number varies based on who you talk to, but you do start having carbon nitrogen reactivity. So you do need to be mindful of your absolute max temperature. Um, so you can still get pretty hot, but at some point you will start making these materials. You can probably play certain games with the, the gaseous environment to mitigate formation of nit nitriles and other things. Um, and so yeah, it, it is quite stable in nitrogen. Uh, the other issue you're gonna have is slow sublimation because the actual sublimation point of carbon is 3000 C or whatever. 
but that's the temperature at which the vapor pressure of carbon is in the atmosphere. But that doesn't mean that there's no sublimation lower temps. So you will have like very, very slow sublimation over the course of operation. And it's obviously it's going to be an Arrhenius type relationship. So if you get really hot, that's going to exacerbate the issue. But at lower temperatures, it's like a, a totally manageable situation. Thank you. Lilia. Do you have um, competitor companies? What's yep. the so, landscape like? Yeah, so another one that's actually been featured on Volts as well, it's called Rondo Energy. Um, so they, they have a kind of a similar approach. So rather than graphite, they use like fire brick, which is like some aluminosilicate. Um, and so I guess one of the differences between our technology and theirs is uh, that a fire brick is like a pretty poor thermal conductor. And we rely on the thermal conductivity of graphite to help bring energy from the interior of the block to the surface. Because uh -huh. once it reaches the surface, we rely on radiative heat transfer, which is incredibly powerful at these temperatures. Um, but uh, you know, if you have a really poor thermal conductivity block, like you take energy out of the surface, you make a huge temperature gradient as you start pulling out that energy. And a lot of energy is basically just stuck there and you need to discharge very slowly to extract it. Um, so I think Rondo gets around that problem by having like basically like a porous framework. So a, like a lot of blocks with a lot of space in between. And I, okay. I believe they pump argon or some gas through there to extract the energy. Um, we, uh, and I, I mean, that's fine. Like they have a pilot system that, that seems to work. Pumping around really high temperature gases and other things is hard because like not that many things are stable. So you need to have really custom designed pumps and things like that. Um, but they're definitely one that's that's out there. There's a company uh, in Australia, I think it's like 1414, that uses silicon as their storage means. 1414C is the melting temperature of silicon. Uh, so they, I think they use like essentially the phase change material of silicon for their oh. storage, which is pretty good. But uh, anytime you deal with phase changes, you deal with like, um, potential uh, just gradual over time creepage and destruction of your materials. Say if things solidify, they go to the bottom and slowly they start kind of building up and pressing out the bottom a little bit. And it's generally not great to, for long-term durations. Um, and then there's another company, Bren Miller Energy out of Israel. Um, I'm not familiar with the details. I think it's a lot like Rondo. I mean, Rondo is a lot like us, but um, they also have some pilot project out there, and they're actually one of the most vocal in the disbursement of various announcements. So you see them pretty often on LinkedIn. Um, and then there are also, but it should be noted that so these companies are thermal energy storage only. They don't really have the electrical component. Um, but uh, that that isn't to say that these aren't viable. Like. I, like I was mentioning, the market for these things is like absolutely enormous, and we don't even have the bandwidth to to do that. So it's better if there's more people, in my opinion. Also, like more people to pay lobbyists in some ways, um, <laughs> because uh, you know the IRA has been is like going to be a huge boon to us and all these companies across many sectors, and like having uh, people with a lot of cachet saying like, you know, there's all these provisions like, oh, a battery module. If you have a battery module, you can get this crack spread and like having people lobby like, what is a battery module to say like a battery module is a thing that stores energy. It doesn't have to be like, you know, the thing with a plus and a minus terminal on it. Um, so just like the ability of like collective action to help. You can call it corruption, I guess. Um, that is unfortunately how the government works. Uh, so I'd like totally reconcile it, but I mean, it is, I guess, a highly legal activity, but our government is kind of messed up. Um, so, so that's always helpful to have, you know, people who are on our side, even if they want to take the same projects we what we do. Um, and there's also a lot of companies in the storage space more generally that are looking at long duration solutions. So one is Form Energy, which is a really great company out of MIT. Now it's also in Berkeley. Um, they build iron air batteries. They're exclusively for en electrical energy storage. Um, and so they're looking at at like utility scale deployments of these systems. Um, then you have like um, 
what do you call it? Compressed air storage. Uh, so you basically have cavern, you pump a bunch of gas in there when you have uh, electricity. And when you want to deploy it, you run it through a turbine. Um, so that's great for larger scale installations in particular locations where you have access to these caverns and stuff like that. Um, I mean, uh, in, in some senses, a competitor to us is gas because they provide okay. energy on demand, which is kind of what we do. Uh, so they are really the competitor to beat because they're an established technology. They work. They're just bad. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's like a, it's it's definitely a smaller space than some of the other energy, like, like the PV, like solar PV is like totally saturated with so many different competitors. Uh, but there's, you know, a couple ideas that people are working on now to, to try to do that for thermal energy. Thank Great. you. Taryn, we, we've got a question in the uh, comment box from oh. Ethan Osborne. It says, uh, what are some of the research and development questions Antora is trying to answer now with the photovoltaics? Um, and how difficult is it to implement the cells into the structures themselves alongside the carbon blocks? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple areas of research there. So one is trying to understand the re reliability of our cells. So when you subject them to like different phenomena, like high temperatures, um, like carbonaceous environments, uh, like dirty environments where they can get soiled and like not see as many photons. Um, so yeah, we have like some high temperature testing, um, like just long duration temp tests that we just keep them in the oven at 1,000, uh, 100, 1,000, 100 degrees Celsius for weeks and see like how the properties degrade over time. Um, and really like trying to understand like the uh, manufacturing regularity. So as we scale up and make like tons and tons of these cells, um, how robust are our processes and how do we maximize our yields to, uh, because you know every so often you'll have a cell that's like shunted, meaning that it's basically a short circuit or, or other sorts of problems. So trying to understand on like a larger scale what causes these problems. Um, You'll have things like understanding the temperature dependence of the efficiency of, of our cells. Um, so that's kind of, I would say, the more near-term uh, things. We also have like longer-term programs that we will like kind of be rolling out over time, which is like, uh, you know, we have single junction cells right now, which means we have one PN junction. Um, as we get into more complex uh, technologies, like the way we'll act, probably access the higher efficiencies is using multi-junctions, which means you have many, many PN junctions each of which is kind of at a different band gap. So you can capture different sets of energy uh, as it kind of goes through the cell. Uh, so you minimize what's called thermalization losses. So these are losses. Uh, so if you consider a silicon cell with like a 1.1 EV band gap, if you get a 1.1 EV photon, like you can use all of its energy to convert into electrons. But if you have a 1.5 EV photon, you can use 1.1 EV of that and 0.4 of that becomes heat and it's gone. Uh, if you have a multi-junction cell, there might be a cell on top that's like a 1.3 EV. So that everything 1.3 and above, it handles that and it passes through the lower energy photons. And then those lower energy photons are captured by the bottom cell. So you can you can kind of boost your efficiencies in little ways like that. So that is that is going to be an extensive research program because that is kind of is relatively complicated and hard to make sure that you can do that while maintaining really high reflectance, for example. Um, and then there's also a lot of work um, on the more commercial side of that in tying cells together into modules. So that's understanding like how do you mount cells on a module and have them stick under various conditions. And let's say if you have inhomogeneous illumination, some of the cells might get really hot, some of the cells will not get as hot, and some of them might peel. So you want to try to guard against that. You want to understand like what is the optimal orientation of these things inside uh, our chamber so you can maintain homogeneous illumination. Um, then there's also a design of uh, like the hot side of that. So, um, you know, our thing is just gonna be spewing out photons, but um, what do you put in between like the really, really dirty gas environment that exists inside our energy storage system and the cells which need to be really clean because otherwise they'll just not produce any electricity anymore. So. There's work on understanding what we call like a secondary emitter in there to, you know, you know, have something that's stable to pretty high temperatures, but also allows for a homogeneous illumination intensity. Um, and 
and yeah, so just generally understanding the cooling processes of those cells because it's uh, when you have this huge temperature difference of like 60 degrees on one side and 1500 degrees on the other side, um, how do you make sure your cells are cool? Uh, so, because if you lose cooling for like a couple minutes, like you're not going to have cells anymore. They're just going to be, you know, arsenic vapor. <laughs> um, so just got to be really careful about a lot of those things. But yeah, we're tackling kind of those one at a time. Hey, Thank you. We're at um, eight o'clock, but could I squeeze in like one or two more quick questions? <laughs> Do you yes, have time for that? Or... Um, I, I just wanted to, to raise like one point that maybe captures a, a question in the comments as well. Um, you know, since I don't understand like 90% of the science that you're talking about right now, um, there's a lot of social science, you know, at work here too. Like you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. You mentioned the role of lobbying. Like, what do you see as like the, the non-science hurdles, burial, uh, barriers, you know, mm -hmm. challenges that are going to be the greatest ones for, for you as an organization to sort of, you know, th start thinking about now or that you're already thinking about, or, you know, are going to be an important part of deploying this technology into the future. Like, is it funding? Are you publicly traded? Is it just staffing up? Is it being in more places than, you know, Northern California? Like, what? Well, I'll let you you get the point. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to start out, we are not publicly traded. We're currently trying to raise another round of funding from venture capitalists. Um, but I would say there's there's a lot of challenges outside of the tech world. And then, I mean, I guess they're kind of tied in with that. But um, one is like securing contracts with renewable developers, because that's actually a key because you can say like, oh, there's like cheap electricity, but you need to have access to it. You need to have like a literal wire handed to you with power. Um, so you need to make deals with developers so that you can have first preference for some of their lower cost energy. So that that's a really big one. I think that's actually an advantage we have over a lot of other companies is that we've really developed those relationships with various renewable suppliers. Um, then there's going to be like a lot of regulatory hurdles because this, like when people think 2000 degrees Celsius, they rightfully will be pretty scared of that. Um, and so getting a permit for doing some of these things is it can be quite hard because it's it's not like a, a photovoltaic uh, installation where there's like you know a, there's a thing called you know UL listed so underwriters laboratory if they say like this is okay that means like oh this is safe and it can be implemented so like you know there might be some standards by a governing body like IEEE that says like oh if it satisfies X Y and Z then like you're good to go uh, there's nothing like that for anything that we're really doing so convincing people that this is like a really safe thing to be doing is, is going to be a big deal. Um, and then let's see. So uh, I guess bankability is another really big one. So uh, another problem with having a first of its kind technology um, that's like a large capital intensive project is that like it requires a lot of money and no one wants to give you money if they're not like pretty confident they're going to get it back. So um it's a, a kind of a big thing to demonstrate to them like this project has very low risk. It uses a lot of technology that has been used before. That's why we like to emphasize that like we use a lot of stuff that is in existence in very large scales with large supply chains. Um, but but yeah, just just kind of convincing people that our technology is is reliable. Um, and then there's the other, I guess, challenge of like getting the first few customers every time you move to a new industry to bite, because um, there are a lot of advantages for first movers, but there's an incredible amount of risk. So not only for funding, but also for a person who's hosting your site, because um, that's that's not only risk to them, but it's a huge risk to us, because if our thing fails in our first customer, then we're kind of host. Um, so that's kind of a big one. And I mean, there's, there's many more. So like on the hiring front, it's... It, it's not like we're in an industry where there's a lot of precedent. Um, so there's not a lot of companies to do what we do. So when we hire people, it's not like there's just tons of people. It's like, yeah, I work at 1500 degrees C, you know, with carbon materials all the time. So you have to pick people who are like, hey, we worked at high temperatures or we've worked with carbon before. Or, you know, you try to figure out like what's the best match you can get without being perfect, but also being able to contribute really well. So finding those people is very challenging. Um, and, and yeah, making sure we're kind of operating in like a policy environment that's conducive to 
renewables is is pretty important. So um, making sure like, you know, when IRS writes the laws uh, based on, let's say, the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act, like the people actually write into the tax code, like making sure that the rules they make are, you know, amenable to the largest degree of decarbonization. And that would, you know, in some ways benefits us, obviously, because like we're contributing to that, but we want to make sure that we have policies that help us operate. Um, so that, that's always a hard one because, you know, government has, you know, everyone and their mother coming to them for their own exceptions into the law. Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's probably, oh, and I guess like uh, anytime we were trying to do like uh, R&D initiatives, a lot of that money is going to come from grant organizations like the government. And so that's kind of, it's like a big job to be writing like 100 page proposals for that sort of thing. So making sure that you have people who are like really organized and understanding like the exact thing that what they want so that involves a lot of discussions with the funders to figure out like what are you most interested in funding um and just like a high degree of organization um there's like our own financial arm which is like getting people who know how to work with small companies but also know how to finance large projects it's like not a, again not a huge skill set so um yeah there's like a ton of challenges like it's like technology is one of many, many challenges that we have. All right. Thank you. I feel like we've we've gobbled up too much of your time already. So thank uh, you. I did want to address uh, Jimmy's question that he put here because I thought that's, that might be important for ah, yes. our students as well. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I think, is Professor Van Hecke still there? He is, yeah. He, wow. he retired, but yeah. he saw his office. So if next time you're <laughs> on campus, um, sometimes he's he's around. Wow. Okay. Um, but yeah, I remember one thing. I think he was the one who said it. Is like within like the first year you graduate, you'll be most thankful for your major, and then the second year, like a couple years after, you'll be thankful for the core, and then several years you'll be thankful for everything that you learned. Um, and I think that kind of holds. Like for me, the most valuable thing right now at my stage of the career is going to be the the core. I just thought that having such a breadth was incredibly useful for me because I guess specifically for me in the company I'm a jack of all trades master of none so I'm I'm quite knowledgeable about many areas of companies but there will be someone with greater expertise than myself so being able to like quickly pick up like kind of disparate topics uh, is really been informed by some of the things that I learned at Harvey Mudd. Um, chemistry in particular like I don't know. I, I just kind of feel that regardless of what you learn, like you learn how to learn and you learn new things faster once you learn how to learn how to learn stuff. Um, that's that's kind of what I think. Mean. I mean, certainly I think about like thermodynamics and kinetics of gas phase reactivity for some time. Like, I mean, although I guess when you think about these high temperatures, what you learn at in normal chemistry class is kind of out the window because everything operates at equilibrium instantaneously, which is weird. Um, but but yeah, so there's Kind of that. I mean, Matt Sai at Stanford is like, I mean, my grad school work is like highly relevant to what I'm doing right now. Um, it, I mean, again, it's it's useful in the sense that like I understand like how to conduct research and like how to like have answer real questions and back it up with experiments and calculations and stuff like that. And that's all useful. Um, but uh, I guess a lot of the stuff I learned, I kind of learned on the job. Um, because when I came in, like, I couldn't even write the diet equation for you. And then like a year later, that, that was like my primary thing that I was using. So there was just like a lot of just like getting better at learning uh, in school. And then that just kind of helped me. All right, great. And sorry, I missed that question. I didn't have my chat box open. Um, all right, great. Well, Taryn, thanks again so much for taking the time to present to us tonight. And Lilia, thanks so much for making the connection and, and helping put this together. It was a, a super uh, dialogue, really informative and just hopeful. It gives a lot of hope too for a lot of like the hard challenges that we have in decarbonization. So um, just awesome. awesome. Yeah, well, thank you all for showing up tonight and listening and it'll be on our website and our, our YouTube page. And Taryn, at some point in the future, we'll have to reconnect and, and get you to give us a little update on how things are going. Of course. All righty. Take care, everybody.
All right. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Great.